Yesterday, my dad was all excited to finally buy this gorgeous one-story brick house in Indigo Lake, Texas. It was so elegant, refined, copious amounts of land to run around, a vista of Sylvian charm. No annoying neighbors, unless they were on the road. We brought all of our belongings and finally came face to face with what was going to be a beautiful nightmare. As we unpacked and arriving at the steps, immediately, strange things started to happen. The protected door opened by itself, and even the grand door that led inside the house as well, just creaked loudly, as if it were telling us to go inside. My dad thought carpenters were working there as it was still being worked on, but only a day or two to finally complete it. My brothers exchanged confused glances and noticed the back of the house had this weird looking pond. Behind it was a vast forest that had this sort of small cavern slash grotto, which made absolutely no sense. We were wrapped in complete forest, so it was pretty creepy. We stepped inside, ignoring the doors opening and were completely astonished with how beautiful the house was. I still remember being seven years old and in awe, with so many things the previous owner left. It was like going back in time. Exquisite paintings, china vases, samurai swords, a chimney with a moose taxidermy above it. Oh my gosh, it was beautiful. To the right, as soon as you walk in, was the kitchen and a strip down that led to the washing machines as well as the backyard. To the left of the living room was a fork. On the right side was gonna be my parents' room. Straight led to a grand room, which we named an arcade room. It was a long hallway to get to the arcade room and left of it led to another hallway. But what was odd of this was that there was a small shower and toilet along with a long mirror that coated the wall and led to a door which was my brother's room in a closet. That made no sense. From my brother's room, it led you back to the fork living room and the restroom was in the middle. The arcade room was so cold. Even during summer when you opened the windows, it was still freezing. Everyone who came would complain about how cold it was. Dad thought it was just a small draft. We had a foosball table, PlayStation system, video games, mini movie theater, and even a gym in that arcade room. Night falls, and my dad buys the Blair Witch Project. Yep, scared the hell out of me. We were taking care of my uncle's sweet chihuahua named Brandy, who out of nowhere began barking furiously at the wall in the kitchen. She had all her hairs standing up on a foamy mouth by how angry she was. I grabbed her and put her in the washing room where she just whined. My dad was dismissive of the idea that we were living in a haunted house, but that night after the movie ending was something I'm never gonna forget as this presence started immediately to show itself. I made the decision to sleep in my parents' room for a while. In that room, was a painting of a boy and a girl on a countryside walk, on a road, next to a man who was behind. I'm getting chills just being reminded of this painting. My brother is snoring in his room, and my parents are awake, and we begin to hear loud furniture swinging and rustling across. The nails are scratching the walls, and these sort of chain noises are coming from the attic with a as if someone was calling a dog. Right then and there, man, my heart sunk and I knew this place was haunted. My dad gets up and knocks on my brother's door, thinking he moved things, but he's fast asleep. The noises were brushed off, just a raccoon outside or the forest trees swinging due to the wind. My heart is racing and constantly thinking of the Blair Witch Project, which made it worse thinking it was real. Because you know, at the time, internet wasn't a popular thing to see if a movie was fake. I left a small nightlight on 
and it was probably eleven or midnight when my parents fell asleep. As the night pressed, I dozed and woke up. My parents were sound asleep. The door of their room is completely open, and vividly remembered we locked it. My heart is racing, as I know something is really wrong. At the foot of my bed, the end is sunken down as if someone was sitting on it, and I felt it sink down. You guys, I felt it, and I was about to pass out and throw up. When suddenly the covers of my bed toss, and I immediately felt these hands and fingernails tickle my feet. I get chills remembering it. I kicked back whatever it was, and could feel the hairs on these hands. Just massive hairy hands and arms. I yelled. I got up from a nest of blankets and somehow jumped straight into my parents' bed crying. My parents console me. Dad gets up, turns the light on and I'm done. Right there and then I'm crying in my mum's shoulder that I don't want to live here anymore. After consoling, my dad and mum are somewhat wanting to believe me, but they can't. That night I slept in between them. I didn't sleep. My eyes were glued to the door, waiting for it to open. Next day comes, and my brother is working out in the arcade room as he plays varsity football in high school. He comes rushing to us, saying he saw little girl's feet with frilly socks on near the hallway, with a lengthy mirror. My dad doesn't believe it, but he becomes a believer eventually. I'm going to go ahead to share the experiences that happened after. A few nights later, my father is in the bathroom. He had a habit of urinating sitting down at night, so that no one gets interrupted sleep. From the windows, the moon is able to reflect some light that gallantly pierces through. As my dad is urinating, he notices my mum is at the door, and says he will be done shortly. So he does his thing, and right as soon as he's about to pat my mum on the back to let her go, my dad goes right through her, the silhouette, I mean, and he falls over. That night is the one I remember he finally became a believer, and shouting at us to come out, and turns on all the lights. He was as pale as a ghost, but I was relieved that I wasn't crazy. Water always turned on as well. Bath water, even the shower, where the long mirror hallway was. One time after a party finished and everyone went home, I took a long bath with my action figures and had a huge curtain that covered it. My mum sometimes would use the bathroom whenever I showered, so I heard her walk in and notice the shadow pass and would just say, Hey mum? No response. So, whatever, off I played, and upon finishing the bath, the bathroom door was wide open. I came out telling my mum why she didn't close the door, and she said that she didn't use the bathroom and was outside cleaning up. It was scary. A lot of stuff went on in that house. We had family friends stay the night to look over the house while we went on a trip. That following night, they called us saying they were leaving as they were getting too spooked. The couple kept having dreams of a handsome man with hairy hands touching them, and he would laugh a lot. And his wife said that the painting in my parents' room was moving. She noticed the kids in the painting moving, and the television in that room turned on and the volume would flood up so high to the max. They left in the middle of the night, after a mere few hours. We were all painting the fence of the house, and saw neighbours jogging on the road. They approached us and told us the house had belonged to an artist who ended his life in our garage. No one ever got close to him, as he was always reserved and spoke to no one. But joggers would see him with art supplies all the time. No one ever knew who the girl that my brother saw was. Right then and there, my mum called her, who was a spiritual person, and told her to take incense and just walk around and talk kindly to the man and ask him to leave. After the small ritual, we never felt anything. Looking back, it feels odd to have been scared. 
Maybe he was just really lonely and in a dark place at the time and was just playing with me, wanting his presence to be acknowledged. The carpenters even mentioned that they would see a girl roaming around our pond with this strange face scarf on. Funny thing is, my mum stayed at home while my dad worked and while my brother and I were in school. She never experienced or heard anything. Anyway, we ended up selling the house because it was flooding a lot. And the creepy part about the grotto in the back, near the farmer's pond, was that after coming back from evacuating the floods, we found so many dead animals stacked on top of each other. Dog, geese, cats, two horse and owls. It just gives me the shivers every day. The arcade room is still frozen cold as well. I haven't been back, but I would be more than happy to share the paintings that he had in the house, as all of his belongings are in storage. My 23 year old mother was murdered when I was a baby. It happened in our house and nobody knew what actually happened. Throughout my life, there have been times where I feel like she's around. And the last few weeks, I felt like it nonstop. I don't have any form of audio or video to prove this, but I feel her and I've seen her in dreams for years. So for a little backstory, her life was tragically cut short in 1998. I was two and the youngest of three children. I was the only one home when she died. My dad, brother and sister were on a mini trip for the week. I think why I feel her and my siblings happen is because when she passed away, she knew I was still home. And I think she wanted to protect me and just hasn't ever left. So the house I mentioned where my mum's life was cut short, I used to see shadow figures pretty commonly. I never saw her, but I felt her presence from time to time since I was a kid. And I would see shadow figures. And at one point I drew them, but the drawings are on an iPad that is now broken. The two main ones I would see were a shadow figure wearing a hat, which I've read is pretty common. I never saw eyes nor face. It was just that, a dark mass. This was always seen in the downstairs bedroom. The other shadow figure I would see a lot was a long, lanky one. I don't think I've read about them, but they were long and seemed to be slouched down. They usually looked like they have their heads held down like they were sad. Sometimes I would see two or three of these at once. I never saw these in my bedroom almost always on the main floor of the house. And even if I looked at them, it's like they needed me to see them. Kind of rarely, but sometimes around the house, I would see the hooded shadow figure, who again, I think is a common one. The hats and hooded shadows always seem scary, but not the lanky sad ones. I wouldn't go near them if I saw them, but I never felt scared or hid when I did. So there's been a time I've seen a ghost as well. I was in my bedroom upstairs. I remember I woke up and saw a bright ghost. I could see his face in uniform and he told me to get out, which is when I moved my bedroom from upstairs to downstairs. The ghost almost appeared to look like a civil war or colonial man. I'm not a history person, but he was definitely old timey. The last story is one of my brother's friends that used to come over all the time and would always hang out in the basement. The basement was unfinished when we moved in, but we finished it and the bathroom in the basement was always scary to me. It always felt like I was being watched in there, even though I never saw anything. So anyway, my brother's friend one day went in there and ran out and had my dad call his parents to pick him up. We didn't know why for many years until one day he told us that he saw a full bodied apparition of an old man with a big beard in there. After that, he never returned to our house. After we moved, I've never seen a shadow or ghost. It's been seven years now. And I still feel my mom's presence like I used to in the old house. About two years ago, 
my nana brought home a Ouija board that she found at a yard sale. I've always been a true believer in the paranormal, and it's always been one of my peak interests. I've heard and read enough stories and watched enough shows to know not to mess around with a Ouija board, and quite frankly, they sort of freaked me out, so I wanted nothing to do with it. My nana, on the other hand, doesn't believe in the paranormal whatsoever, and thought it would be a fun game for myself, my brother, and the oldest of my two cousins. I left it on the dining room table for days before she made me put it away. I ended up sliding it under my bed in the hopes of just forgetting about it. My brother of 11 and my cousin of 12 hugged me about it constantly because they wanted to play with it and I wouldn't let them. I tried to explain it to them that it wasn't just a game and that it shouldn't be messed with, but they were preteen boys who couldn't help but do things they shouldn't. One day after I got home from work, the boys were there and I had this sneaking suspicion they played with it. I looked under my bed and it was there, but I had this odd feeling. And when I went downstairs and interrogated them about it, at first they denied it, but I saw right through them and they finally admitted that they had played with it. I asked them if they had said goodbye when they were done and they said they did. My cousin likes to over exaggerate stories big time and make up details to be overly dramatic. So when he told me about a couple of things that supposedly happened, I didn't believe him at all. Also, they were boys who liked to mess with each other. So I assumed that that was happening now. A couple of nights later, I got into bed. And as I lay there trying to fall asleep, I get this feeling like I'm being watched. I look over at my closet that has two large sliding doors, and I notice that one of the doors is slightly ajar, which left a small space between the doors. It creeped me out for some reason, so I turned and faced the other way, trying to ignore everything and fall asleep. I finally fell asleep, and the next thing I know, I'm woken up by what felt like someone or something hitting me in the back of the head. I was laying on my back, so the back of my head was fully on my pillow, which made it even weirder. And it wasn't a light hit either. It freaked me out so much, I was shaking. I look around my room and don't see anything. But then, all of a sudden, I hear my floor creaking like someone is walking around my bed. I'm so freaked out at this point, it wasn't funny. After laying there a good little while, I finally got the courage to get up and grab my phone and book it to my living room. I sat down and tried to calm, but I still could feel a tingling pulsing sensation on the back of my head. I turned on my phone and realized it was three in the morning. I called my boyfriend, now husband, with tears streaming down my face from being so freaked out. He didn't pick up. And I swear I called him another 15 to 20 times before I finally gave up. I sat in the chair until my Nana got up around six. I didn't tell her what happened because I knew she wouldn't believe me and say that I was acting dumb. After she got up, I had breakfast and called my boyfriend again and he finally answered. He told me he had his phone on silent, so he didn't know that I had been calling. I gave him so much crap for this and told him what happened, and he felt so bad and like an idiot for having his phone on silent. He told me he would have come over in a heartbeat to comfort me, and was so apologetic. Later that day, he never came over, and we took the Ouija board to a junkyard to get rid of it. My husband is the only one in my family that knows what happened, and I didn't experience anything after I got rid of it. Moral of the story? Ouija boards shouldn't be messed with. I am a 25 year old and live in the UK. I've always believed in the paranormal and have had a few experiences in my life and have been told by a medium that I am sensitive to it. This particular experience happened at my aunt Claire's house when I was around 10. She used to live in a small two bedroom house in a town called Green Hill. Many things happened in this house in the few years that she lived there. 
and I can safely say I am so glad that she moved away from this awful, accursed home. It started out with small, little things, like footsteps being heard when no one was moving around the house, and things moving by themselves, as well as shadows out of the corner of your eye. But things took a pretty sinister turn in the space of a week, when a few key events happened. The first scary thing that occurred was between myself and my aunt's two sons, Tyler and Seb. We spent a lot of time in the backyard playing in the mud and climbing trees. But on this particular day, we opted to dig a hole for some reason. I don't really remember why, but regardless, we dug at the dirt at the bottom of the garden. This garden was long and led to the forest and fields on the back of the house. It was cut off from them with an old rotten wooded fence. We chose to dig in the middle of the trees at a particularly muddy area. And as soon as we hit something hard, we decided to dig it out, assuming as children that it was some lost treasure we were unearthing and that we had hit the jackpot. Instead, as we dug, we found a skull. We screamed for my aunt and mum and showed them, and they looked at each other mumbling about being someone's old pet. But at the time, I thought nothing of it. But would find out at the age of 18 it was the skull of a baby, and that my aunt never managed to find out any information on it even after taking it to the police. This would then start a chain of events that none of us foresaw. It happened on firework night, and myself, Seb, Tyler, Claire, my mum and dad and my aunt's boyfriend were chilling downstairs. All the kids by myself were asleep, when we heard the sound of boots on the floor above us, which was impossible, as we were the only ones home and everyone was accounted for in the living room. My aunt shrugged it off and said that it must be pipes. A while later, I walked past the stairway to get into the kitchen, and from the corner of my eye, I saw something that resembled the large shadow of a man swinging from the ceiling of the landing. I stopped and let out a little shriek, and it was gone. My aunt asked me what I'd seen, and I told her, and she looked sick. I was later to learn that this is a regular occurrence. Along with the occurrence was one that I myself had witnessed when asleep in bed, when we had stayed over for the night, as we did often. Both the boys would be in bed, and you would hear children's laughter and running through the house. Later that night, scratching could be heard throughout the house, but could never be placed as each time you thought you had pinned it, it would move to the opposite wall or area you were at. We were watching a film called Silence of the Lambs, which certainly didn't help the atmosphere. Great film, by the way. And halfway through the film, my dad left to get takeout, so the movie was paused as we all sat laughing and talking when an almighty boom resounded through the house coming from upstairs. We all leaped upstairs, including my sleeping cousins, who awoke, startled and confused. We proceeded to follow my aunt's boyfriend upstairs to investigate, and on first glance, nothing seemed to be amiss. All the doors were open, and nothing seemed to have fallen. This all changed when my aunt's son, Tyler, asked, Mum, what's that? pointing to something laying against the wall. My aunt bent to pick it up and almost threw it at my mum, gasping, My God. I looked at my mum, who was holding a small white and pink laced baby shoe that had small dark patches on it. Everyone had gone as white as a ghost and looked startled. I should now say that my aunt had no girls at the time, and the boys were nine and six. This is when my mum looked up and shouted, Claire, the attic's open. How the hell is it open? When I tell you the attic's open, I don't just mean it was unsealed. See, in this house, in the attic, you'd need to push up and slide across to open it. And rarely do they have ladders. At least these houses don't. This particular attic wasn't just open, but the lid had been completely pushed up and moved to the inside of it. So the attic was now completely open, and you could see all the darkness above, 
and the shininess of the plastic bin bags ahead. This was insane. As before my aunt had moved in, the attic had been checked and resealed, as the attic was completely empty and had new heat protection in there, so there should be no black bags in there. The reason the opening of the attic was also so terrifying is because the attic had been painted over and sealed with a special sealant to keep it and to stop any draft from coming through it. My aunt's boyfriend then retrieved the bag to find that it was a bag of baby clothes that had never been seen there before and did not belong to my aunt. We were all rushed downstairs and a few hours later, my dad and my aunt's boyfriend had a fire going and burnt the shoe on baby clothes. I still today don't know what was on the baby's shoe and I have never wanted to ask for fear of an answer. The story does not end here though. After this event, the feeling in the house got worse and became a dark and scary place to stay. And you could feel as though you were being watched and would often feel someone breathe on your neck. My aunt only managed to cope for a year when she decided to move away and get out the house. Six months after she left, there was a house fire there and the man who lived there sadly passed away. But this got my aunt interested and she looked into the history of the house and was horrified to discover upon researching that the house had a dark past, which had meant that every household had either lost one member or the family in its entirety who occupied it. This is where things started to make sense. The man who lived there before had had severe depression and ended his life on the landing light fixture. The family beforehand had lost members to carbon monoxide poisoning, and the family before that had lost a child and a family pet to a house fire. The record she found only went back so far, but there's still so much unknown about the house. We, however, believe that the house was cursed and my aunt was lucky to have gotten out alive with her entire family. I know the house is still there and my ex fiance lives not too far away from it but I have no desire to go back and find out what happened to anyone else who lived there. And it was a really dark and scary time for me and my aunt. We've never looked back. And personally, I avoid going anywhere near it. I'm 23 now. This started when I was three or four. Everything that happened that night I remember like it was yesterday. The memory is so vivid and forever in my mind. The second floor of my house at the time was really just a small landing with three bedrooms and a bathroom off it. Immediately at the top and to your right was my bedroom. The bathroom adjacent to the stairs, then my sister's bedroom and my parents' bedroom. My mom would put my sister and I to bed at seven o'clock every night. I always had issues falling asleep as a kid, but would eventually drift off. My bedroom had a closet next to the door and next to that, two windows with a dresser sitting between them, with my bed pushed against the wall, foot end of the bed near the door. One night, not unlike any other, we're put to bed and I finally find sleep after a few hours of just lying there, only to wake up some hours later. It was about two or three in the morning. I rolled over to scan my room. I've always been afraid of the dark. So the room was lit up and my nightlight was plugged in at the end of the bed. Standing in front of the window furthest from me, near the closet, I saw what I thought at the time was an angel, quite literally glittering gold in front of my eyes, standing at least seven feet tall, staring out the window. My movement must have grabbed its attention because immediately its head turned to look at me. There were no facial features except for a strong defined jawline, though faceless. It wasn't like a freaky facelessness. At this point, I was more curious than afraid. Then it started to yell at me. It kept telling me to shut up. The yelling quickly turned to screaming and I freaked. I was one giant goosebump, and I got up from bed, opened my door and looked into the lit hallway. 
My parents always left that light on at night in case my sister or I needed something or got scared in the middle of the night. Almost in slow motion, I noticed the air felt too still. Something was off. Before I could process anything, I took one step forward and out of the bathroom shoots this thing. It gets right in front of my face, screaming a blood curdling scream that still echoes in my ear to the day. The face of this thing was just gray and sinister. Eyes completely blacked out, skin cracked, no lips, just a black hollow hole with the screams coming from it. Long black hair flying around as if there were a fan switched on behind it and I lost it. I screamed so loud, I swear the entire house shook. I barged into my parents' room, tears streaming uncontrollably down my face. My mum looked scared and confused. My dad, just terrified. I don't remember what happened after that. I'm sure I told my parents what happened and ended up sleeping with them for the next few weeks. Growing up, I asked my mum about that night, and she explained how I barged in crying, rambling off some story about an angel or something. Today, I don't know what it was. My dad, on the other hand, never said much about it, and instead started warning me to stay away from Ouija boards, and told me some freaky stories about things that had happened to him. As my parents divorced, growing up, things got worse with respect to what I was being exposed to. My dad would show me scary pop-up videos and play creepy music. I was six or seven at this point. Safe to say I hated going to my dad's because I thought whatever I'd seen that night was somehow connected to him. Eventually, my mom remarried. We moved and things were okay. Then I decided to stop seeing my dad completely for unrelated reasons as I was nine years old at this time. And that's when things started again. The air was ridiculously heavy all the time. I hated sleeping in my room. I always felt like there was something at the end of my bed, just watching me. I tried to ignore it. For nine years, constantly living in fear, we moved out of that house to somewhere around the corner. And once my mum and stepdad divorced, that way we wouldn't have to switch schools as I was about to graduate high school and my sister still had one more year. I still had access to the house as my ex-stepdad still lived there. They were using my old bedroom for storage and always kept the blinds closed as I had while living there. One morning when everyone in my old house was at work, my friend and I decided to sesh in the garage quickly. We had the okay from the ex-stepdad so long as we weren't driving anywhere afterwards. We walked through the front door, through the foyer to the garage, and got settled. I could already feel the extra 10 pounds on my chest, and I really wanted to make this quick. I had previously spoken with my friend about what I was feeling in this house, as we had been friends for years at this point, but never gave her much context. Not even five minutes into the sesh, we heard the footsteps above the garage, i.e. my old bedroom. My entire body went cold. My friend immediately looked at me, and we waited for another second and heard them again. This time, like a stomp type running around the room. We said screw it, packed up and got the hell out of there. I locked up and walked down the driveway completely freaked, trying to push the thousands of thoughts running through my mind out my head. Then, my friend let out a tiny shriek. I turned back to immediately ask her what was wrong. They were doing some work. I thought she could have stepped on a rogue nail or something, but the horror was written on her face, and I looked up at the window where the blinds were closed. I asked her again what was up, she said for whatever reason, she felt like she needed to look up to my old bedroom. She said the blinds were open in the window looking down on us. And I quote her words, this thing with black hair and black eyes and cracked skin and just a hollow black hole for a mouth 
was staring down. She said it so fast, terror was oozing from every word she said. That's when she burst into tears. And so did I. I was too freaked out to tell her what happened when I was a kid. And I didn't want to scare her more. I suggested we get the hell out of there. Since then, nothing's happened. I recently traveled to Rome, specifically the Vatican, and got a blessed St. Michael pendant for extra measure, seeing as whatever it was followed me in silence throughout the years. The thing hasn't bothered me other than showing up in a very specific nightmare I've had every eight to 10 years since my first encounter. If this thing is still on my tail, I'll be due for a nightmare within the next year. Back in the 80s, I was in college and lived in a dorm room. I never owned a Ouija board, but if someone had one, then I'd either watch or participate. To be honest, this was one of the first times I ever used it. I had a question for the board. My grandmother had my father when she was young and single. That was a big deal back in the 1930s. When she found out she was pregnant, she ran away from home, dropped my father off at her parents' house when he was six months old and left, coming to visit less and less frequently. By the time he was five, she'd never come back at all and vanished. So my father was raised by an aunt, never really knew his mother and didn't have any idea who his father was. By the time he was in his forties, he wanted to find her. Lots of dead ends, but he eventually did. Anyway, that night I asked the board if my grandmother was alive. The board said yes, and I asked if she lived in my home state. The board said yes. I asked if she lived in my hometown. The board said yes. I asked what street she lived on, and the board spelled out the name of the street, Washington Street. At the time, I wasn't sure if there was a Washington Street in my hometown, but it turns out there was. No, grandma didn't live there, but two years later, my father found his mum. She lived in my home state in the town of Washington. It wasn't the street's name, it was the town's name. How messed up is that? More than 30 years later, I still have no explanation. I've got an interesting story I would like to share with you. So family from my mother's side have been having some strange events happen to them. My maternal grandfather talked about his mum and dad standing around him three days before he passed. And the day he did die, he told my aunt that his parents were in the room and telling him that he would be joining them at 2.30 that night. He breathed his last that hour. My maternal uncle woke up suddenly in the dead of night and his wife asked him, where did he think he was going at three in the morning? He replied that his mother was outside asking him to come over to her. He died within 20 minutes. My late mother asked me once, who was the third person besides you and your father as you were talking to me? I replied, no one. Later she said her parents were there saying that she would be with them shortly and that they would have to come and take her. Sometime later, she named a few more folks standing around her and passed away shortly after. But the strangest of all these occurrences is that of a 28 year old man, the son of a very close family friend of my parents in law. It baffles me to this day. He was visiting his parents on leave from Moscow, where he was stationed as part of a MNC staff. His younger sister was getting married and the house was packed with guests. He woke up at 1230 at night, was a bit panicky. His Russian wife called in his elder brother who found his youngest brother crying in a state of panic. The younger man asked for his mother and once she arrived, asked for her to stay with him since they would arrive at four in the morning to take him. The guy was clean, had always been drug free. His elder brother suggested they visit a hospital and let them run whatever tests they need to. Maybe he was suffering from something and perhaps it was just a nightmare but he agreed and insisted that his mother came along. They brought him to a nearby facility. The ER docs and nurses were skeptical, but they ran the tests anyway. Alcohol, drugs, EKG, and a few others, all normal. They told him that he was as fit as a fiddle and could proceed home. 
However, the young man was still panicky, and at the insistence of the family, the hospital agreed to detain him until morning. A few minutes before 4am, he said, They have arrived. They are tall, many of them in white robes. Their faces are covered and they are angels. They are all surrounding my bed and the room is full of them. At precisely 4am, he went limp, ceased breathing, and was declared dead. I am the youngest of four brothers, all a year apart. At this time, I was about nine, and our family friend was spending the night at our place. We lived in a two-story house with a basement. At this time, my mother was single and dating a lot. So during this particular night, she was away. We saw how to make a Ouija board on this episode of a show called Mystery Hunters, a Canadian kids channel, YTV. So we decided it would be a fun thing to try while we had the house to ourselves. So we cut up an old cardboard box and made a Ouija board from it. We put felt on the bottom of the triangle thing so that it would slide better and it worked pretty well. We all tried putting our fingers on the triangle and asking questions, but got no response. Then me and my brother asked a question to the likes of, is there a demon here? And the triangle started to move. We looked at each other and the expression on our faces showed that it was neither of us moving the triangle. We immediately got scared and ran into the kitchen. When we got there, we heard a crash come from the living room. It sounded like our TV fell off the wall unit. But when we ran back, we saw that nothing was wrong. After this, we decided to grab a Bible and read. The first words we read in unison were, God's people are doomed. Frightened by this, we turned on the TV and saw it was Dave Chappelle, so we assumed it was going to be something funny. But when the audio began, the first words from Dave were, and all the people died to which the audience started laughing, and then it went to a commercial. Freaked out by both of these strange and unlikely things happening, the waterworks began, and we got up and ran upstairs crying and screaming to my brother's bedroom. When we got up the stairs and into his bedroom, we heard footsteps that sounded exactly like ours run up the stairs after us. Immediately, I assumed it was one of my brothers or our friends late up the stairs. But then we realized we were all in the room and no one passed by the door. We began to panic. So we held each other freaking out. It's hard to say if we heard anything after this point. So this was the last that happened for now. Two hours later, me and my brother, the bravest of the four, decided that this might be all in our heads and that we would go play video games on my mom's computer in her office. Diablo 2 to be exact. The door to her office had no handle, so my brother pushed the door open, and immediately after he pushed the door, it slammed back on his arm, and all the way from the basement we heard clear and loud laughter. The only way I can describe it is it was the sound of a witch that echoed through the entire house. At this point we ran down the stairs, out the door into my grandmother's house, which was down the street, and waited for mum to come home. I'm not sure if she completely believed us, but this was when we were kids. I'm 23 years old now, and this story sticks out as the only and craziest paranormal experience I have ever had. Having so much history myself with the paranormal, I don't freak out over creaks in the floor or the occasional door shutting on its own. I believe most things can be explained. When we first moved into this house in Washington three years ago, we saw a few random orbs here and there, nothing that felt harmful. In fact, one orb even danced to the music alongside my granddaughter one day, and it felt like a child. The house sits on acres of field, surrounded by forest and a few farms. For some reason, the guest room, laundry room and bathroom are always freezing cold. Plus, cool air comes from the guest bedroom closet. 
I keep a blanket hanging up in the hallway door to keep the cold isolated. I figure those rooms are just cold because they are added on and are built halfway over our well. I have my mother's ashes in my home, but at the same time I felt bad because when I was asked if I wanted my sister's ashes later, it scared me for some reason. I don't know why. She was a very loving person, but for many years I felt darkness around her and I just couldn't. A year passed and that fear left me. I remember her telling me one day before she died that she had a recurring dream of her death and she was stuck in the desert. It then dawned on me that her ashes were being cared for by my daughter who lives in the desert. It was time to let her be here with mum. After she arrived, her ashes were placed next to our mother's ashes outside my room. And like my mother, she was surrounded by some of her mementos. At first, there wasn't a problem. But after time, that's when the kids started seeing and experiencing things that made them feel uncomfortable. It didn't feel like my sister. This was something else. Strangely, absolutely no one in the family has felt her presence since she passed. I know my kids look towards me for assurance. I guess they thought that, like in other homes, I could just make it all go away. But I think they stayed hidden from me in the beginning and preyed on those who showed fear. So it was targeting my grown kids, that being my son and his fiance. I felt bad. I kept telling my son that there was nothing here and that our house wasn't haunted because we cleansed it after my sister passed away. Cody, if you're hearing this, I'm sorry for not wanting to believe you at the time. I was just trying to protect you and the kids from being scared. So there are a few things that have been happening in our home for the past few years. One late afternoon, I was at the store. So my son and his fiance were watching my two grandchildren for me. They were playing hide and seek. They told me something wasn't right in there. Each of them experienced what they said felt like someone or something taking up space within them in the closet, practically in their face. It had been a toy room in the beginning, but the kids wouldn't play in there. The only person who has ever slept there with no problem is my ex on a visit. He was a non-believer until just the day when we were sitting in there watching a show together and we observed his dog intently follow something move around the room and the bathroom door opened and his dog watched whatever it was going to the bathroom and the door shut behind it. At that point, his dog dove under the blanket. My ex's eyes were as big as saucers and he asked me if I saw what he saw. Laughing inside at the former non-believer, I said yes. No one will ever sleep in there, not even me. Six months ago, my son told me that he went into the kitchen to grab something to drink the night before and he saw a dark shadow over his left shoulder in his reflection on the microwave. He turned around quickly to look behind him and there was nothing there. He still felt something close to him and the hair on his arm and neck were raised. So when he looked into his reflection this time in the window over the sink and again, it was back with its head even closer to his. Then the cabinet door shook back and forth then opened all the way and shut. He said that he yelled, not caring if he woke anyone up and ran upstairs to his room. I don't blame him. Many times he and his fiance have seen big shadow masses in corners of various rooms, but never in my bedroom. Waiting outside my door where my sister's ashes are, but never inside my room. There was a time not too long ago, they were both sitting in my van talking one night. And they said the form of a man came out from behind a tree, crossed the grass and sat with his hands in his lap on the front porch and then faded away. Then they told me about the bathroom. Oh my, that bathroom. I can't even. 
His fiance was taking a bath after everyone had gone to sleep, as to not disturb anyone. She was relaxing in our big old claw bathtub, in the quiet of night, and she heard all of us sleeping, so she knew for a fact no one was up. There was a tapping on the bathroom door, and she answered, to no response. The doorknob started to jiggle, then stopped, so she asked again, Who is it? I'm in the tub. There was still no response. She thought that whoever it was decided to go to the other bathroom, so she relaxed, and she was laying there. But then something felt off, as she heard a noise at the door, and she watched as the doorknob slowly unlocked itself. When she told me that, my blood ran cold. This didn't just happen once. My son was sitting in there and he heard tapping, followed by the door unlocking on him too. The other day, my son said that he had gone to the bathroom around three in the morning. He knew everyone was asleep because he heard all of us snoring, so he didn't quite shut the door all the way, but it was closed. He heard heavy breathing as if someone had their mouth at the crack of the door. Then he heard a quiet voice whisper, I can hear you. That poor boy was scared to death. I, for the first time, experienced the doorknob unlocking itself on me three times in a row in my bathroom last night. That surprised me. It has not always been bad experiences here, though. Since my mother passed, I feel her sometimes around me. We all do. Just last month, I was talking to my son in the living room, and I saw a light. We don't live near a street, so it wasn't from a car. It was soft and illuminating, as it floated from the front window curtain around to the wall behind my son. I got such a warm feeling and said, Hey, Mama, and watched it as it went behind the recliner, where my son was sitting, and then up behind his head and disappeared. He didn't see this or know why I said that. Just then he shrugged his shoulders up and put his hands on the back of his head, saying that it felt like his hair was being stroked. That brought tears to both of us. We all know when she is here because it feels warm and loving like her. And sometimes we smell her sweet perfume. My grandson who is autistic was too young to comprehend my mother's passing. He sometimes talks to her, almost like he is answering what seems to be a question. He is only six and has the purest soul. I wish I could hear her voice speak to me again. And then, you have things that happen that at the time you didn't understand. But when you find out everything falls into place, this was one such time. In March, I had a few aluminium balloons left over from my grandson's birthday, and they lasted a very long time. All of them fell to the floor except one particular balloon. It kept following me midway in the air around the house. The air conditioner nor heater was on, and all the windows were shut. I went to my bedroom, and it followed and stayed in my bed. I went into the laundry room, and it followed there as well. This went on for a solid week after a while. It just started getting annoying, but we didn't think anything of it. We just swatted it away. One day, my son and I were talking in the kitchen, and it came in from the living room, where we just saw it laying on the floor moments before and lowered itself to go under the door frame and stopped mid-height between us. He took it and pushed it back into the living room. Not four minutes later, and it was back mid-height between us. This time, he put it all the way in the laundry room, and it still made its way back, lowering to come through two door frames and staying afloat midway between us again. At that point, it was too weird. We both looked at each other and said, nah. So I took it and said, okay, okay. If this is you, mum, do it again. I put it back in the living room and it stayed there floating. It didn't feel like her at the moment. It felt different, almost familiar, but not in a bad way. We went back to talking and there it was again between us. 
Well, I didn't know this at the time. In fact, I only just found out a few weeks ago that my dear friend passed away in March and his family didn't have my number to tell me. One of the last things he told me was that when he dies, he was going to come harass me just for fun and let me know that he's here and he loves me. When I found out, I called out to my son saying, it was Tom, it was Tom after all. After I told him the sad news, he said that it gave him a bit of peace. We all knew that this is something he would do and it blew our minds. I just wish I found out then so that I could have told him that I love him too. Three nights ago, I saw a light low to the ground in the kitchen and five minutes later, my granddaughter saw the same light formed like a feather fluttering in front of her. My son also told me that a light trailed up over and across in his room. Another time he walked into my room and saw a light above my head. My neighbor is confident something happened on this land. I talked to him to see if he had been experiencing or seeing anything unusual without making myself look crazy. He said that he does not go out after dark, but he has heard the screams in the forest and his pets acting strangely from time to time. As we were talking, his roommate came home and asked me what we were talking about. When I told him, he pointed to the young man I was talking to first and said, you see, I'm not nuts. Apparently, he had seen things as well and calls what he sees in his bedroom a demon boy because he doesn't know what it is. He even saged in this room. And if you think about it, that goes along with the orb that danced with my granddaughter when we first moved in. And no, it's not a demon. I think that perhaps it's a child that connected or roams the property. We have seen so many beautiful things here that it outweighs the bad. Some day after I'm gone, I hope to be a part of it. I want to be the whisper of encouragement if my loved one's ears and a gentle stroke upon their face. I want them to always know that they don't have to be afraid and that they are and always will be loved from now until forever. As for what is in this house, I think since I have been more aware of the darkness, it shows itself less. I do enjoy feeling my loved ones around though and my kids do too. Someday we will move from this place and hopefully one of our loved ones will follow. Today, when I arrived home after running errands, my ex told me that without a doubt, he saw something. At first, I told him to stop playing around because I thought he was making fun of us. I've known this man for 24 years, so I know when he's serious. And this time he was definitely shaken. He said that he was standing in the guest room and he was about to go into the bathroom to wash his hands when someone tall who he thought was my son turned on the light and darted into the bathroom really fast, closing the door behind him. He waited for a bit, but didn't hear anything. He got tired of waiting, washed his hands in the kitchen and still hadn't heard anything for a while. So we went to the door and asked if my son was okay to not receive an answer, but the light was still on. He tentatively pushed open the door to find nothing. Confused, he went to my son's room and knocked and asked him why he did that and left the light on. But when my son came out of his room, he was wearing a burgundy shirt and pants. With a shake in his voice, my ex asked if he had changed his clothes, to which my son responds, no, why? The person my ex saw was wearing a blue t-shirt and shorts. My son told me that when he opened the door, my ex turned pale. On another occasion, my son's fiance was in the kitchen today and we are all putting away groceries. She has mid length hair and in front of everyone, her hair flipped up like someone tossed it. It freaked her out and she said it gave her shivers. I promised my other son I would come help paint his new place. So I bathed my grandkids and made them something to eat. I figured I would only be gone a few hours, but it took way longer than expected. When I arrived, there were all kinds of commotions going on in my room. 
and my grandson was crying uncontrollably. No one could understand him because he was so upset, so he was trying to act out what just happened. After I calmed him down, he told me that he was getting tired and laid down. He said something woke him up, and he heard my car, so he went towards the bedroom door. When a dark hole formed at the top, outside my door, and a dark shadow boy thing came out of it. He said the boy stood in the doorway and pushed him back and slammed the baby gate, trapping him in the room. He said it was evil. He kept saying that over and over, he's evil. After the gate shut, my grandson screamed, so everyone in the house ran to see what was wrong. I know kids have active imaginations, but I know him. He's autistic, and he doesn't lie or make things up. He was visibly shaken up, and since last night, his story hasn't changed. When my mum was 18, she was hit by a city truck that had run a red light. Her collarbone was crushed, and she had slammed her head against the window so hard that paramedics had declared her dead at the scene. Despite being revived in the ambulance, her parents were called and told that she had died, and the local news station also reported the incident as having ended her life. When she arrived in hospital, she was alive but unconscious. She remained in a coma for several weeks before waking up in a confused state. At the time, she could not remember what had happened to her in the moments leading up to the incident, nor could she recall anything from the comatose. My mother was sent to a rehabilitation center previously used as a tuberculosis ward in the 60s. While there, she was horribly mistreated by hospital staff and even recalls being molested and watched while taking showers. I'm a firm believer in the idea that some people, in order to heal from traumatic events, choose to not remember them at all. I also believed, up until recently, that this was the coping mechanism my mum used to overcome the trauma surrounding her incident. However, recently my mum started seeing a therapist in an attempt to unlock her memories from the event, in order for her to heal from them further. She called me a few nights ago after waking from a dream in which she could recall her comatose state. The following is what she told me she could remember. She told me she remembered hearing people's voices around her, her parents crying and my father staying by her side the entire time, unwilling to leave even for a second. She remembers hearing many voices constantly and being unable to respond to them. She remembers feeling trapped in her body, unable to move or tell anyone what was going on. She says she can remember waking up and still feeling trapped for a long time, while her body began to adjust to life again. She told me it was the most painful, miserable experience of her life, but that she was so grateful that she could remember it because she had always been racking her brains for those memories she knew she had. Moral of the story, if someone you care about is in a coma, talk to them, even if you know they can't respond. The sound of your voice will calm them and let them know that you are there. In 1979, when my mother was 15, a large group of my extended family were gathered in my grandmother's house in rural Iowa, where most of them live. They were there to discuss what was to be done with my recently deceased great-grandmother's house. You see, my great-grandmother had hated the house and so in the final six months of her life, had built another house on the same plot of land, which I guess wasn't in accordance with state zoning laws. As any logical thinker would do, they decided to ask my great-grandmother herself. Ouija board in hand, the female members in the family walk out into the night to do their seance at her house, which was just down the dirt road from where they were. The house was built in the mid 19th century, had six bedrooms, was huge, and from what I can gather, didn't have any electricity. So they brought candles to light the space. About half the women in attendance were believers, with the others being skeptics, which led to some frustration with them asking questions on the Ouija board. However, sometime in the night, the energy of the house totally changed. 
One of my aunts asked if Margaret was there, but got no response from the board. Instead, a piece of tinsel on the doorway began to swing like a pendulum. My mum's youngest brother had just celebrated his birthday there a few weeks earlier, and the decorations were still up. It would be easy to say that the wind or atmospheric pressure could have accounted for this. However, keep in mind it was in a large house, and the rooms surrounding the central living room acted as a wind block. It is also worthwhile to point out that the candles at no point flickered nor went out. The movement continued with every question, back and forth like a pendulum. Finally, someone asks what was going to be done with the house, and the tinsel stopped moving altogether, and began to violently move in the opposite direction. The tinsel stopped responding after the question, so they moved back to the Ouija board, and no sooner had they done it did it spell out a very simple six-letter message: "Burn it." They hauled ass back home, called the volunteer fire department, and did just that. Three years ago, I went to Gettysburg with my family. I've been interested in the paranormal since I was small, always drawn to it, seeing and hearing things often. When I left for college, things started happening to my sister, and we realized that she was clairvoyant, and I myself am sensitive. My dad decided he wanted to test this, so he signed the family up for a ghost tour at an old Civil War field hospital. It was turned into a home, then an inn, and finally a landmark. We found out that after many bodies had been thrown from the kitchen to an area besides a building, a woman had ended her life after the government lied about the whereabouts of her fiance during World War II. There was simply so much death. Upon going up to the second floor, I couldn't breathe. I had a panic attack and no warning. I should have left them, but I went on. The others went to the attic. I followed. And later, my sister said that she could have heard a noose tightening. My parents and I saw shadows. We spoke to spirits. It was surreal. They told the men to get out of the bathroom, perhaps because the ladies needed privacy even in death. Things happened. There was so much activity, and I felt watched. We ended up in what used to be a prison for Confederate soldiers. They liked underage women. My sister had been about sixteen. Her hair was played with; she was scratched, and three lines on the back appeared. I felt wrong. We left, and I was angry. We had two more days or so in Gettysburg, and I think I was so wrong that I couldn't get all of these negative thoughts out of my head. I had nightmares. Everything people did annoyed me, and I was inconceivably angry. As soon as we crossed state lines, did I feel that I could breathe again? Later, I was researching about demonic oppression, a step down from possession. It leaves the victim angry, depressed, suicidal, and violent, suffering from night terrors. But nothing touched me. No. Later, I was researching, and although I'm not sure what it was, I don't think it was demonic oppression. It was just oppression by some pissed-off spirits. I am sensitive, so vulnerable, especially going into places that are so packed with energy. I was essentially going in there with a target on my back. My depression, my eating disorders, my deteriorating mental state as a whole, added to the fact that I had secretly stopped taking my medication, also added to the fact that I was feeling insane amounts of jealousy towards my little sister. As my father only seemed to be concerned with her powers, even though I had been doing it for a lot longer, and all of this culminated in a large hole in my defenses, trying to act big and mighty in the face of something you thought you knew about, but really had no experience in dealing with, is a surefire way to get attacked. It's rarely demons doing the attacking. If it was, well, you'd know about it. I'd like to think that I've grown in the last six years since everything's occurred. I found the universe exists in various shades of grey. There is neither good or evil, just lighter and darker varieties. For years now, I've been interested in the paranormal. 
I would do investigations with friends for years and even helped out a paranormal group from time to time. But my best encounter was when I was in the military. I was stationed at one of the army bases in the States and wouldn't have lots to do on the weekends. So one day I was really bored and brought myself a Ouija board, which was a big mistake, but I was a skeptic and needed to know. So I would do it with friends mainly and nothing major happened except we would have the mover go by quickly. Several times we got responses, but the red flag should have been there when we got the response from Zozo and Mama. But then I started seeing stuff. The first time was when we used it in the center for events and volunteering. Nothing major happened, but then one night while volunteering, I went to sit in the giant room for conferences just to think. The middle lights were on and the front and back ones were off and I was just sitting in the back. At some point, this man suddenly walks from one side of the front of the room to the middle front. I was about to ask if he was there for volunteering, but then I realized that he came from where there was no door. Then it looked at me in the eyes and there was a shine in it like an animal's eyes. And I just took off and ran. I went back in a little while later, but there was no one there. You would think I would stop using the board, right? No. I'd used it in my room with a friend one time. And afterwards, one night while sleeping, I opened my eyes and looked at a silhouette of a man standing at the far corner of my room. It then started walking towards me. And as I began shaking my head, it was gone. The next night I put a movie on in my portable DVD player and I slept, no encounter. After a while, I turned my player off to sleep. That night I woke up again when a young woman's figure was right near me by my bed. She began to reach for me and I shook my head and she too was gone. The remaining nights in that barrack, I kept that thing playing. Before I left the military, a few friends and I used the board one last time in another hangout place that was said to be haunted. Nothing happened to us, but a friend who was also a volunteer in the hallway said that she heard three loud hissing sounds and three laughters in her ear. She never went back there. Since my experience, I haven't touched a Ouija board since, though it's still in the box of my room. Some part of me wants to throw it out, but I've heard stories of people burning it or throwing it out for its return. Since then, I haven't had a true experience, but I do have that player playing every day while I sleep. For those of you wanting to play the Ouija board, do realize when you play it, you're going to be opening a door to something you don't know or couldn't possibly understand. I got lucky. When I was younger, the show Ghost Hunters was a new thing. Me and my friend used to hang around the local ice rink in Flagstaff, Arizona and call out spirits for fun. The first night was something I'll never forget. That night, we saw a soda can get lifted and suspended in the air for a second, then drop. There's a shed next to the ice rink with a garage door, and there was a banging on the door and the lights came on inside. The only way to get in was the side door or the garage door, and neither had been open. We started telling some other people about it. Next thing you know, people would come around the woods Buffalo Park next to the ice rink to call out spirits. We've seen full body apparitions with red eyes. Three people saw a little girl turn into a wolf and run off into pitch darkness at the same time. We've had several people with us when we saw yellow darting eyes and had a drum approach us at the very end. And it was like someone banged a drum in front of us and everyone ran in fear. Some wild stuff. Hard to get others to believe my story, so I hardly tell them. And years later, I went through a religious phase and became Christian after straightening my life out. While praying in my living room, my bedroom was tossed around. I heard my name being called out by what sounded like a chorus, and I had a demonic hiss in my ear, and I thought I could feel the breath of whatever it was after I prayed for God to help me with this strange encounter. It stopped after that and didn't resume until another two years later. I was with my girlfriend at the time, asleep in my room, 
When I woke up laying on my side, and I saw what looked like black stripes of cloth that had a smoky texture to them above my girlfriend, half awake, I reached over to hear and shook her. Then I rolled over to see what looked like the grim reaper on my ceiling. It was like a hooded figure, pitch black, smoky texture, but you could see the outline of its body like its arms, head and torso. Its robes were moving like they were alive. It was the hardest thing to explain, but I felt like every part of this being was alive, like some sort of energy you could sense. It leaned down like it was trying to get a better look of me, and I lost it. My body automatically started to scream on its own, louder than I had ever done before. The feeling of fear I felt that day was the most surreal thing I could ever explain. It was so horrific and dreadful, the feeling. My girlfriend woke up amongst the screams and she saw it as well and shut down, crying under her blanket. While I shouted at it to go away. It was like my brain knew what to do, but my body went into action yelling and I just watched and I ended up actually passing out from the fear. The passing out was unusual. I've been on a plane that had an engine failure and almost crashed into trees. And the fear I felt from that, thinking I was certainly gonna pass from this, was not even close to the fear that that thing gave me. It was like my soul was afraid of it, not just my body, my mind. After that encounter, we had a door pop open on its own after waking up at 3 a.m. And that was the end of it for a long time. Fast forward to now, I live in an apartment with my daughter and her mother. We've not had much unusual stuff happen since we've been together. The only strange thing we've had is we both wake up at 1.20 a.m. And when my girlfriend was pregnant and her waters broke minutes after. But that I think is just a coincidence. But the other night I woke up and saw a dark figure rising out of the space between our closet and doorway. Thinking I was just half awake and still dreaming, I shrugged it off as that, just a dream. Then the following day, my girlfriend and me are home, and we start hearing serious banging on the bathroom door while in the living room watching TV. I rush to see why my girlfriend is making so much noise, and we meet in the hallway. She was frustrated asking why I would scare her like that, and told her I had just gotten up to see what the noise was, and she gave me a frightened look and told me she didn't believe me, and we got into a short argument about it. The next night I'm awake in bed next to her, and we're both on our phones when we hear what sounds like someone going through our kitchen drawers. The sound of silverware rustling around and the wood drawers sliding open was enough to make me get up and grab my Mossberg and my girlfriend to phone the police. I turn on my tack light and investigate the potential intruders. When I hit the kitchen, it's clear that the kitchen drawers are open, which is strange. I switch on the light, and the living room light is on, but there's nothing. I check my daughter's playroom and the bathroom, and it's all clear. I realize no windows have been opened, the front door is locked and not messed with, and I tell my girlfriend to inform the dispatcher there was no break-in. They tell her they still want to send an officer to follow out, but we decline and let the woman on the phone know we'll call if need be. We make sure the house is clear one final time, talk about what happened and go to sleep. Just this morning I wake up with my girlfriend and we start our day as usual by heading up to the kitchen to get our daughter's breakfast started. But now everything is open. Drawers, cabinets, nothing's thrown out, nothing is taken nor destroyed. But we both look at each other. We know something isn't right and we try and see what we can do. My girlfriend found a shop that sells crystals and all the other kinds of stuff, and we get something called Hollywood and candles. We're told to burn the candles while burning the Hollywood, and say a prayer while walking into the room with the burning Hollywood. As far as this moment goes, I haven't seen or heard anything, but I'm 100% certain something did attach itself to me at some point. All I'm hoping is this is the end, and I've gotten rid of it. All my life, I've been told I'm special and that I have abilities and to trust my intuition. I always have, and there have been many times where I've encountered supernatural entities. As a toddler, when I would be at my grandparents, I'd spend hours in my grandparents' bedroom in the corner, 
looking at the window and talking to my deceased great-grandfather Jack. I don't recall what I would talk to him about, but this did scare my family quite a bit, as I knew things from my conversations with him about my family that happened before I was born. This went on for years every time I was at my grandparents' house. When I was around ten, I got up in the middle of the night near Christmas Eve to go to the restroom, and halfway there something caught my eye. I saw the black silhouette of something, or someone, hiding behind the archway. I could see a big beard, and it was taking deep breaths, slowly. I thought it was my father and said, Nice try, I see you. But there was no response. Just the slow, deep and constant breathing from this dark figure with a large beard. I started to feel an overwhelming sense of dread that made me feel sick, and I dropped to my knees. Whatever this thing was, it looked malicious, and the energy from it was affecting me physically. I looked back up to confront it, but it was gone. It had vanished, but I was still very physically sick for the next few hours, as its residual energy remained. Sometime later, when I'm 18, I'm in my bedroom, AC off, windows closed. It was a still night, and there was no drafts in my room. I was browsing the internet on my iBook, and all of a sudden I had this pain in my head. It felt as if I'd been hit by something at the back of my head, and started to make me feel the same type of dread that I felt when I saw and felt the entity when I was ten, and also made me feel like I was being watched. I began to look around my room to see if there was anything in it. I couldn't see anything like I did when I was ten, but I could feel it. The level of dread I felt was no way near as intense as when I was ten, and it didn't make me feel weak and physically sick, but it did make me feel ill. I then saw the dream catcher hanging over my window start to move. It moved slowly and gently at first, but then it became faster and more violent. It built up speed, moving back and forth over a few minutes, until it was being so violently moved that it ripped off the wall above the window and flew across the room. After this, the feeling quickly lifted and I assumed the entity had left. In my early twenties, I encountered the most malicious entity I'd ever felt. I'd moved into a new house, freshly built, and at first, things would be out of place or moved, and I just thought it was me, as I've always been a scatterbrain. The first time I saw it, I was in my ensuite, and I got the most intense chill down my spine and every single hair on my body stood on end. I didn't feel dread this time. I felt what I can only call pure hatred and rage. There aren't quite words to describe it, but that's as close as I can put into words. That's when I saw it, in the ensuite mirror, that just outside the door, there was the darkest silhouette I've ever seen. It was darker than the darkest night, and it wasn't in an unlit hall. All the lights were on, but it was as if it was absorbing all the light coming near it. I could also see black, tiny orbs floating around it. Due to the rage and fear I was feeling from it, I wasn't scared or sick. I was furious, screaming at it. What do you want? What are you? I picked up a bottle of aftershave and threw it at the entity. It went through it and shattered the mirror behind it as it faded away. Not instantly disappearing in the blink of an eye like my previous experience, no. It just slowly dissipated into nothing. Over the next two years, I continued to randomly see this entity. There'd be months between sightings at least. I'd always see it in only two areas of the house, the kitchen and the ensuite. I'd always feel these feelings of hatred and rage every time and the chills down my spine would become more intense. I could feel this thing wanting me dead. I tried to communicate with it, but it never would respond or show any sign of wanting to communicate. I'm a pagan, so I tried some rituals to no avail, and as a last resort, I decided to try a spirit board. I performed the protection circle ritual, 
are more protective crystals and started at 3 a.m. I lit six candles in a circle around me and asked for any spirits with me to speak up through the spirit board. And the planchette started to move. W E C U. The chill returned and all my hair stood on end. After I read that, I was terrified. I looked up and was in shock and couldn't move a muscle. It wasn't just the one pure black entity. There were six of them, side by side watching me. I opened my mouth to ask what they wanted, but before I could make any words out, the candles blew out and the salt protection circle was blown away in a gust of air breaking it. And I was violently pulled by my feet and dragged out the circle while screaming in terror. The entities weren't touching me, they were watching me. Nothing visible was pulling me. I was dragged out my lounge room and towards the garage. And as I was pulled through the garage internal door, I smacked my head on the concrete floor and passed out. When I came to, my head was pounding and my head was bleeding severely. I remember what happened and my flight response kicked in and I got up and ran as fast as I could to the front door. I ripped the door open and got into the car that was on the street and started it before I put it in gear. I looked back and the figures were watching me from the front bedroom window. I put the car in gear and floored it. I never returned and had movers move everything to a new home. The entities didn't follow. There is a spirit in my new home though, but I believe it's my great grandfather. And every now and then I smell the strongest cigarette smoke and I feel loved. I believe he's watching over me in my new house. And I've never experienced anything that's so malicious and plain evil like I did with those six entities. And I knew they wanted me gone. But why? I'll never know. Not that I wish to know. I had a long talk with my dad last night about the house I grew up in. I lived there from about age six to 15. I'm 21 now. Apparently the previous owner was a recluse and mentally ill. He chose to end his life with a shotgun in my bedroom, next to the window. There's a bleached spot there on the hardwood floor that I had always covered up with a chair his brother would check on him periodically, but this time he didn't for about three weeks, then came over and found him dead. My dad found this out after we moved in. He said a police officer came up to him when he was doing yard work and said, don't let the history of this place scare you. It's a beautiful property. And my dad was like, what? Needless to say, I'm creeped out. I don't remember ever feeling unsafe in the house, but the lock on my door had locked itself numerous times during the first year we lived there. I vividly remember being locked inside there with my friend one day and firefighters had to come and pull us out the window. After that, my father just straight up took the doorknob off. So I had no doorknob growing up. There were also crosses above my sister and I's door that I never really questioned, but apparently my dad had a priest come over and bless the doorway. This affected my dad a lot. One day he was doing roof work on a ladder right outside my window, perfectly in control. When the ladder folded and slipped sideways and he fell 10 feet and almost died. And when my parents got divorced and my mum took my sister and I to live elsewhere, my dad lived there alone for two years. He said it got so disturbing, he finally had to move. He said that when he came home from work at night through the basement, it would reek of smoke. The man was a smoker when alive. The scent was so strong, he was convinced on several occasions that someone had broken in. But then my dad would go upstairs and come back down as a test and the smell would be gone. I'm just a little spooked finding out that I lived in a room where this had happened, especially since I had my own attempt in that same room. Just kind of a mind blow. 
Does anyone else have like positive stories of this kind of spirit moving on after or something like that? I'm having a hard time processing all of this and really hope that the man is at rest now. This all happened at the same house, which was an 100 year old farmhouse that was also a part of the Underground Railroad. We no longer live there. The house doesn't even stand there anymore. It's a very expensive neighborhood. My parents said that they were sitting on our couch and watching TV. The fireplace shutters opened and closed several times on their own. On another occasion, my mum was sitting in the same living room. Towards her front was a large wooden deck that had a fireplace in the center and two large windows on either side. To the right was a concrete porch that ran the length of the side of the house. It had a door off to the side and had several large windows on it as well. To her back was a bedroom that us kids shared in the winter because it was easier to heat half the house. To her left was the blue room. The whole thing was blue, but it was just a central room where our computer happened to be and had access to the basement. Anyway, on the wooden deck, my mum saw a black figure that was as tall as a bear, but too thin to be human. She said that it looked at her and had a feeling it was watching her. It wasn't completely dark outside, but it was on its way. The figure then started doing laps around the house. It would pass the window in front of her every few seconds. This was a 2,500 ish square foot farmhouse. It was incredibly fast. We had a small family farm of chicken, goats, pigs, quail, turkeys, and ducks. Nothing big, but we had 30 chickens at the time. Living that far out in the country, we always set up traps by the coop to catch possums and raccoons, anything that ate chickens. But we go outside one day to see a pile of feathers throughout the yard and around the coop. Every single pile had a head on top of it. 30-ish piles, and that many heads. No puddles of blood, no insides anywhere, just piles of feathers and heads. Shortly after this, my dad would go out at night with a shotgun to see if he could find anything. We had gotten more chickens and nothing unusual had set the traps. My dad was a manly man, not scared of anything. I've seen him move a tree by himself out of the road that four grown men weren't able to do together. He's tough. So he goes out like he usually does. Our chicken coop sits at about 50 feet ish in front of the garage. It was really just a thousand square foot ranch outbuilding. We just called it the garage. So we hear five blasts or so from the shotgun and very shortly after, my dad comes through the front door with tears running down his face. He is visibly shaking. And after he calms down a bit, he explains that while in front of the garage, he heard a real guttering growl coming from the tree line right behind and above the garage. He said it wasn't like anything he'd ever heard in his life. And he was an avid hunter. Growing up hunting, he's even heard and probably eaten just about any animal that Indiana has to offer. He said it was low and demonic and that he could just feel it was evil. He immediately unloaded the shotgun and ran into the house. The next story I don't like to talk about much, but it's relevant. I would hear voices in that house. One night I woke my parents up crying to let them know that the devil wanted my soul and wouldn't stop trying to get me until I gave it to him. I don't remember much about it because this was about fifth grade. I'm 31 now. And since I've been diagnosed with general anxiety disorder, I can see where it might have just been my anxiety. But I definitely remember sitting on the living room floor sobbing at 3am, just begging for the voices to stop. I haven't had anything else at all similar to this event happen. My parents found a tunnel in our basement that we assumed was part of the Underground Railroad. My cousin was over at the time and asked if he could explore it. It was covered up about shoulder height to an adult and an adult could crawl through with not a whole lot of extra room. We had a flashlight and were gone for about half hour. 
While we were starting to get very worried when we could see the light again, he came back and said that there had not been an end in sight, but he was getting nervous having crawled so far. He was probably about 16-ish. We always had dogs and would just find our dogs in front of our house, passed away, with no wounds or prior symptoms, simply gone, sometimes three at a time. My dad on the way home from work saw a pile of dead dogs in a field by our house, probably about five feet tall. We don't even know how to start to explain that. On another occasion, my two brothers and I were in the house and things started to fall off the walls. We ran outside into the field in front of our house and looked across the street to the other cornfield. There were hundreds of deer running. It filled the field for several minutes. Enough disruption caused by them running made it feel like it was a small earthquake. We found out after we moved that there was also a practicing coven that met not far from our house. We heard that a lot, a lot of dead animal remains have been found as well. So on to the next creepy thing. A decent amount of years later, I went with my sister to Chicago. Her fiance had graduated boot camp and was now going to A school. I'm not a military man, so I'm not sure if any of this sounds incorrect. They do a ceremony for family with their group flags and such. They hang out for a bit and then leave for A school. On their way home, I was asleep in the car and my sister had gotten lost. I shut up out of sleeping and told my sister to pull the car over. She did and I told her to turn. She asked what was wrong and I said that I woke up because we were by our old house and that I could feel it. She made a turn and we passed the front gates of a cemetery that was right by the house. Had she kept going in that direction, we would have passed right by it. What was at the start of all this was a dream that my sister had. I didn't find out about the dream until I was in high school. Anyway, surrounding the end of the property there was a tree line that separated where the coven met in our house. My sister said that in her dream there were monsters tearing down the tree line and that she knew that if they tore it down they'd be coming for me. Only me. Not my sister, nor any of the other people in my family. Well, not long after, in preparation of turning the property into a subdivision, they tore down the tree line. All of the stuff happened. My parents decided one day that we were moving, as we rented, and we had a house purchased on contract, and we were completely moved out in two weeks' time. I remember this other story. This is definitely the event that is the foggiest in my memory. I was in Boy Scouts, and it was the time of the year for popcorn. I sold enough popcorn to be one of the top in the state. That's what my parents told me at least. I just knocked on doors and pushed the popcorn. My parents had loaded up the van with all the popcorn that we were going to deliver the following morning. It was an old brown slash tan Astro van. The ones with the weird curtains in the window. This was completely stuffed with popcorn. We all go to sleep and I remember being outside with my family, looking at our van on fire. The fire department came and everything. The thing burnt completely. Well, my dad takes the picture with him to show people because of the crazy story. My dad is showing a guy the picture and the dude asks him if he sees the face. My dad looks at the picture and sees the face. To kind of summarize this because I don't want to make up details that I don't remember, things started to appear in the picture, like in the flames. It started with a face that turned into a demonic looking Grim Reaper figure, the scythe and all. Then people started to notice more things as my dad showed it to more people. My dad would hand the picture and ask what they saw. Everyone saw it. Then people started noticing the Reaper figure was holding a chain that was attached to a torn apart dog and finally a burning cross behind it. As soon as people started seeing that, my dad stuffed the picture in a Bible. It was one of the Bibles with a built-in zipper and he didn't tell any of us about it until after we moved. He pulls out the Bible while we're moving and the picture's gone. If I remember right, he was freaked the hell out. 
I remember my dad always handing the picture to people and then being all creeped out. I remember seeing the fire. I saw the picture once right after it had been taken and I remember playing on the burnt up van. It was the late 90s and we were kids. The rest of it is what my parents have talked about. My dad was a server at some restaurant for about 25 years, so he showed it to a ton of people. This isn't just a few buddies. He literally started handing it to his customers. Everyone saw it and started to see more. This story takes place in a cabin in Vermont. It was a small room with a lofted area for the bed, a wood stove for heat and no running water. Attached with a composting toilet pretty far away. Nestled into the mountainside on a dirt road, off another dirt road, both formerly logging trails. My girlfriend found the place on Craigslist and wanted to move into it together because in lieu of rent, we could provide eight hours of labor a week to the landlord. I like adventure and the wild setting, and I was nervous that if she went in without me, she would be in over her head. The backstory on the cabin is that it was built by a man with the initials DC in the mid 70s. He suffered from schizophrenia and lived in the cabin while renting out another on the property for income. Somewhere along the line, he had a couple in his rental property who couldn't pay the rent and wouldn't move out, and that upset him. While they were gone, he burnt their home, which he owned, to the ground. In the fallout, their relationship ended, and they drifted away. DC built another cabin, a shack really, two small rooms with a low ceiling, adjacent to the rubble, and moved in. I assume that was so that he could rent out his larger cabin. But no one I spoke to about it could confirm that. Most of the history comes from our landlord, who briefly knew DC, and a college friend of his who still lives on the mountain in a shack made of plastic and tarps with a propane cooking stove for heat. He is a lovely guy and a beautiful artist who doesn't like talking to strangers, but he and I connected over our love of nature and the pursuit of freedom. The shack still stands on the property, but the roof is full of holes and is terribly rotten. It is frankly questionable how a structure as unsound as it is stays up, but it does. The shack overlooks the cabin and can be seen looking out from the bathroom window and the southwest window in the main cabin. It was unearthly to see it in the moonlight. The story I'm about to share took place on November 18th of last year, roughly two weeks after my girlfriend and I moved in. Kaylee had some problems and still does. I loved her dearly, though at this point in time, we were inseparable. The day starts normally. She went to work, I stayed home and gave the dog a bath. The statty stopped by looking for her, second time she was out, and delivered a card. I texted her a photo and told her to get in touch without thinking, and that set her off. I had to go to work, so I sent her a message that I said I trusted her and would see her later. I went to work with the landlord, I mean old POS, one of the bad yogi variety, and left my phone in my coat. We were bucking logs and splitting wood that day, which is warm work as the old saying goes. So I tossed my coat on the side and didn't hear my phone ring. When we were done splitting wood, he needed me to help him drop off a car for his repair as he needed my help because he has no friends and the place we were going to was some rando rustic shop because he thought he could make the guy work for extra cheap. On the way back, I finally take a look at my phone and there's the one message you never ever want to see. The note that says you'll lend your life. We get back to the mountain and I'm at a loss. My car has been sitting there since the day I bought it over because the battery is dead and it has no gas in it because I forgot my wallet the last time I drove it. And her car is a reliable one. And wherever she is, she isn't answering her phone. I tried calling her relatives to no avail. So I mentioned the predicament to my landlord and he cracks a joke 
that she's probably already deceased before covering up with a very hollow, it's usually nothing. He says I can have a half gallon of gas from the can and he'll give me a jump, but that's it. I honestly didn't care because it was enough to get me moving and I was in no mood to be wasting energy. So I set out, jumper cables in the passenger seat, three bucks in my pocket for gas, which was literally all I had at that point, because you don't work for rent if you're flush with cash. And I white knuckled it to town, praying with my whole soul that she would be all right. I drove to all our usual spots with no luck and went to the bar where her sister works in the hope of finding her. She wasn't working. So I gave the bartender my number and asked him to reach out to her saying that it was urgent. Then I went to Kaylee's work, which was babysitting and asked how she was when she left. Her employer told me she had left bitterly, swearing that she was going to end her life. But she hadn't done anything because she didn't think it was important. Just think about that for a moment. Then a glimmer of hope. Her sister has a heads up, a single text message of the letter S. But after roughly five hours up against it, we knew she was still breathing. And you can't imagine my relief. So I went home and waited and kept texting her encouragement. Night fell and I was in the cabin alone, waiting. I'm a little bit of a poet and so I finally sent this poem. Sweet baby girl out on your own, who knows the way that will guide you back home. We love you, we miss you. Our beating hearts have flown out from our chests to seek our missing one. She came home a half hour later, staggered through the door and fell into my arms sobbing. She said that she had stopped three times on her way up to the mountain because she lacked the strength to return but she said I had called her back. I asked her how she was and she said that she felt heavy and cold, like she'd fallen down a dark hole. She said she couldn't find a way out and that she had lost the light. I specifically remember her saying she felt like something was trying to swallow her and wouldn't let her go. Then she looked at me and said she thought something from the cabin or the mountain was attacking her through her Ouija board. At this point, I felt thoroughly up against it. Her Ouija board is over a hundred years old. One of the original boards made from a single piece of wood. I had seen it once or twice, but didn't like it much because of my background. I'm Christian and strongly believe in the existence of demons and spirits and the like. And depending on who you ask, a Ouija board is like a direct door to hell. Her board is stored in a closet under the cabin reachable only by a steep dirt path tucked in any one of a random assortment of boxes. The last time Kaylee had been down there, she very nearly fell on a pair of scissors. To put it bluntly, there were very bad vibes and they were strong. So I told her I would deal with it if she agreed to follow my instructions until we were done. She was nearly dead on her feet and agreed. The first thing I did was to climb to the loft and get my crucifix. It was a gift to me from a man I met walking my dog, passed down to him from his German grandmother who had it blessed by a Catholic priest. I have another story about the crucifix, but that's not for today. I sit her on the couch and hand it to her with the order to hold it in front of her and to not say anything. My father is a pastor and my mother a devout, so I called them. I told my mother what the situation was and she says, you can't exercise a board because it's inherently evil. To which I replied, I know, but I can drive away anything coming through it and bind its power. I asked her to pray for my protection and success and she said she would. I cleared my desk so I had a place to put the board on when I got back. I laid my Bible on it to be ready at hand and put my coat on and looked at the front door. I didn't want to go out. I can't tell you how much I did not want to leave. The board made me uncomfortable on a good day. Now I had to go find it in a closet in the dark by myself with the full knowledge that it was harming my girlfriend. I put on the only headlamp we had, mustered my courage and stepped out. It was dark. There was a slight breeze and the area felt heavy. Imagine the feeling of resistance of walking in a heavy wind 
but without the wind to justify the resistance. I shuffled down to the embankment to the closet, took a deep, deep breath and opened the door. The lamp only lit half the space, and I didn't enjoy that. Fortunately for me, the board was in the first box I opened. We kept it wrapped in a purple alpaca wool shawl with moons and stars on it, that I got from the man that gave me the crucifix, with the intention of keeping it both tucked away and relatively place sated. The shawl was super soft, and the board said it should be cleaned with a silk cloth before use. Unfortunately for me, the shawl was half unwrapped and the naked board was hanging out in the cold. I picked it up by the covered part and wrapped it up. I took one step and something happened. I say something because it felt like I stumbled, but I didn't. I was anticipating everything and didn't want to drop the board or anything. So I was moving slowly and deliberately, but I put my foot down and braced myself from falling over. The second step was the same. I can't really describe it because I didn't feel a hand or a shove and my feet didn't slip or slide, but my balance was all over. I carefully climbed up the embankment and went back in and set the board in the spot I had made for it. I unwrapped it, placed my Bible directly between me and it, sat down, put my hands flat on my desk and went for it. I tried to cast out the evil and bind the board with the most powerful, clear and distinct language I could. As soon as I was done speaking, the heavy feeling that had been lingering vanished. I wrapped up the board and asked Kaylee if it worked. She smiled and nodded, closed her eyes and said that she could feel the light again and the feeling of being trapped was gone. Now there's one last wrinkle I want to leave you with and I swear to you, it's true. The night before it all happened, I had a dream. In that dream, I ran onto a pier through the ocean, through a fence, and the wind and waves were crashing to get to Kaylee, and I carried her back as the storm winds howled and tried to throw us into the sea. When we made land and took shelter, I opened a door into a pillar and thrust her in ahead of me. Then I went in and found the room full of people in historical garb, some 1920s, some earlier. There were about 13, but this was a dream. I do remember clearly a little boy, newsy style, with thick blood coming down from his upper cap and a very haunting look in his eyes. I opened the door and pulled us both out of the room. And that moment was when I woke up. When I was in eighth grade, I used to live with my mother in a camper, which sat in my grandmother's backyard. The living situation was tough, and when you have two people and a dog living in a 50 square foot space, things can get annoying. The camper was a stone's throw away from my grandmother's trailer, and late one night, I woke up having serious stomach trouble. Obviously, since there was no working toilet in the camper, I had to run up to Mama Linda's to use the bathroom. Crucial and funny fact, I sleep with no clothes on and I don't use a bathroom with clothes on either. Weird, I know. But anyway, I got out of bed, put on some shorts and grabbed my shirt because I was in a hurry. When I opened the back door of the trailer, I had my shirt halfway in case I ran into grandma. Sure enough, there she stood in the middle of the hallway. She had cancer at the time and had to go to the bathroom many times during the night. She told me to go ahead and that she would wait on me. So I bolted in. When I got there, I dropped all my clothes next to the toilet and did my thing. Here's where things get a little crazy. When I was done, I looked over to find my clothes and yet there were none there. Only my undergarments remained. Thinking this was crazy, I went back into the hall and asked my grandma, when I came into the house, I was putting on a shirt, right? Yes, she said. Where are they? I told her I had no idea. So I left out the back door and went back to the camper. On my bed laid my shorts and shirt, neatly folded. I was terrified because I remember having them on when I got to Mima's house and she remembered me fiddling with my shirt. Not to forget this was in the wee hours of the morning and through three closed doors. How on earth did my clothes weasel themselves from next to me 
through three walls without me even knowing. I landed a summer job a few years ago while getting my bachelor's degree in history at the Winchester Mystery. For those of you who don't know, the Winchester House is an 160 room mansion built off land purchased by Sarah Winchester at the turn of the 19th century that used to be an eight room farmhouse like any other in pre Silicon Valley. The owners of the place today are descendants of the Brown family who purchased the Victoria home in public auction. They have before claimed it to be the most haunted house in North America. I find the owners of it today to be shady, lucrative people. The admin slash owners treat us like tour guides and are we're on minimum wage. It is hardly a sustainable job if it wasn't for the tips and the nice folk and the generosity of them that they give us at the end of the tours. They typically hire six to 12 tour guides per year, as some do it seasonally and others retire. It's a balance between college slash grad students studying history or in theater programs and middle aged plus elder folk who have been around for quite some time. The medical benefit from the job is, if you get injured at the house, they will pay for all related medical expenses. That's about it from my time working there, which was within the past few years. My role as a tour guide was to coordinate my tours, which ranged from as little as three to 28 people on a 65 minute guided tour within an eight hour shift. So there'd be about four to six tours a day per guide. When I started out, I was given a week to explore the mansion on my own and get a look around. After being tested on a script written in part by the mansion historian, a full time position held by a really nice lady and recycled material from when tours began in the 1920s. I've explored at least 80% of the mansion as some places are locked and really hard to get past. And I've had a handful of unexplainable occurrences. One notable instance is when I was giving a tour to 27 people. While in the 13th bathroom, which had the unfinished state of the art shower, my tour delivery was interrupted by a very faint shriek that sounded as though it were coming down the halls from the switchback staircase. I asked if others had heard it and they said yes, which was quite strange. More eerie, but also, I really am not sure if it was my imagination. And during my second day of training, I walked up the fourth turn of the switchback staircase and thought I heard footsteps to the rhythm of a shadowy figure that suddenly creeped into the corner of my eye. As I walked up the shallow stairs, it was coming up from them and was well behind me. Imagination or not, I ran into the upstairs hay room, which is now a display room for artifacts as fast as I could. Apparently, seeing a shadowy womanly figure in black has been the complaint of others as well. Other things would happen. Like a tour in front of me one time witnessed a photograph frame fall from a high shelf in the ballroom and shatter. The sudden smell of roses in Madame Sarah's dead room. Us guys called it the dead room, but the admins didn't wish guests to know that was the name we gave the room. The scariest experience of all was exploring the unlit attic, which is off limits and used for storage of decor. In between a tour break with my phone flashlight, the beautiful third floor window, which can be seen in nearly every online front picture of the mansion, is where I encountered a horrific grotesque figure in a woman's Victorian morning gown. Its hollow eyes and rotting face were literally set up at the window, holding a rose and pointing outwards. For a mere second, I seized in terror with my phone light fixed. For me to see it was a rubber poseable zombie decor used for spooky events. There were many memories made there. One of my favorite was giving tours to company hosted reservations. Open drinks aren't allowed in the house for purpose of preservation. Say you were to spill it. But when Google and other tech companies bought out the place for the night, the admins would turn a blind eye and ask those of us chosen to host and not ask them to put their drinks away. The employees of said companies were quite nice folk though, and were easy enough to get along with and to entertain.
So this story happened when my family went out to watch my sister's school game, sports thing. It was around 14. Now, I wasn't feeling great, so stayed home watching Enter the Dragon. While watching the movie, I heard our side door open. The hinges were really creaky, and then it shut. Then about two to three heavy footsteps, like someone wearing heavy boots, which made sense as this was December in Michigan. I called out again, but this time I was getting the hairs on my arms and legs sticking up. I was spooked, and again nothing. I said, nope, and bolted out the back sliding door and didn't see my parents' car they took, then hid in the truck bed that was covered in the front of our house for a sec to see if I could see anyone in the house through the living room window. While I waited, I saw a visible human shadow pass in front of the TV. The curtains were closed, mind you, and I bolted like half a mile to a family friend's house. Not fun, barefoot in winter. They took me in and called the cops after I explained what happened and why I was there. The cops came and checked it out but didn't find anything. No wet front prints in our breezeway that let the side door or any wet footprints in the house. The side door was also locked and they even checked for tracks in the snow around the house. But nothing except for my bare footprints running away. I still stand by what I saw and heard and no, it wasn't from the movie itself. The house did and still scares me. My name is Joseph, and I used to live in Folsom, California, the old part. My neighborhood friends were Rob, Kristen, and Robin. I'm on Natoma Street, and they were down at Sibley, Figuera, and Reading Street. Folsom's been around for ages. Used to be a mining town. Gold coming down from Placer, El Dorado, and Amador. It would pass through on its way to San Francisco. So there are a lot of old churches and cemeteries on this side of town. And it's not uncommon to find bones while digging in your yard. Rob lived on Sibley and I on Natoma. And where these streets met are churches and cemeteries. Oh, and a small park in front of his house where we'd kick it. At the time, Rob was dating Kristen, and I had an eye for her friend Robin, which never panned out. But we still hung out as friends, and this is what happened to us one night while hanging out in a graveyard. We walked down Natoma and crossed Folsom Boulevard to hang out in the cemetery where Rob had seen a tombstone with a motorcycle engraving, and had the most wonderful idea to whip out a Ouija board and try to speak with the guy. I always thought these things were nonsense. It says Parker Bros on the box, so to me, it's about as scary as playing Monopoly. That night, the weather wasn't great, but not too bad, cloudy with a breeze, and it took forever to get the candles lit. We all had to open our jackets and huddle up to prevent the wind from blowing out the lighter. So it's set up on the guy's tombstone, candles for effect, and we begin. Stupid questions, giggles, the Hey, I know you guys are moving it. Nobody was taking this seriously. Until the weirdness started. First, the wind picks up and the candles don't go out. Easy enough, trick candles. The ones for birthday cakes that are hard to blow out. But these weren't those. Then the rain begins to drizzle. The board isn't really getting wet, but it is coated in wax, right? No, I don't think that was the reason. I mean, raindrops didn't land on the board at all. We started getting pelted by rain, the board and candles remained as they were. I wish that was the end of it. I was scared, as were the girls, but Rob couldn't be more excited. Then someone says, what's that? There are lights at the cemetery, kind of like street lights along the fence and driveway. And we could see something moving about 50 to 60 yards away, a silhouette. A shadow moving from tree to tree, getting closer. It moved really fast. At about 30 yards, it passed under a streetlight, and we could see it was just a blob of black, and we all ran. Rob's fastest, and I'm behind the girls, keeping that thing over my shoulder following the star on Rob's starter jacket. When running in the dark in between tombstones and trees, making our way to the front gate, when I felt something grab my leg. 
It was the chain that ran along the top of the posts at the driveway, but I thought it had me when I looked front to see where I was going. I broke the chain and wrapped around my leg. I ran across Folsom Boulevard with one of the posts still attached, and when I stopped to pull it off, I realized that I had wet myself. I don't remember if we met up in the park or if we just ran all the way home, but I'm glad that that thing didn't cross the street. I'm sure for them, that was that, but it didn't end for me. I ruined a pair of jeans that I'd have to explain. I had a deep bruise around my throat I'd have to explain, but what I couldn't explain was the damn Ouija board in my room. We ran. I didn't go back for it, and neither did they. But I'm crapping myself because it's sitting on my bed. I'd rather get caught with a dime bag or a dirty magazine than this. This is totally forbidden in my house, and now I had to hide it until garbage day. I took all the garbage bags out of the can and put it on the bottom and stacked the bags on top. Job done. Nope. At some point, it's back in my room. We had a cord of firewood on the side of the house, so I wedged it in tight and stacked logs on it, totally hidden till garbage day, and managed to get it out the can before anyone could notice. But then it was back again. At this point, I'm terrified. I threw it in a field, hid it in a friend's house to no avail. My last attempt to get rid of it worked. I took my nan's rosary and a few things precious to me, but worth it. Buried it in the graveyard of the old church downtown and said out loud, this is holy ground and if anyone can hear me, please keep this thing away from me. I don't know if it stayed put, but it never came back to me. I'm still fearful of these things. When I'm watching paranormal TV shows, I'll fast forward or skip an episode because I don't even want the image on my TV. Since then, I've seen stuff that will make your hair fall out and fracture your sense of self, or maybe just break your soul. But perhaps it's only me. I was devastated when my father passed away and I wasn't there to say goodbye as I lived in a different state. After the funeral and I returned home, I started to find rusty quarters, not just one or two, but about 15. They were in the oddest places like my bed, the guest toilet, the seat of my car, in the driveway. There were too many in such a short span of time that I had mentioned it to a friend and she told me sometimes loved ones who have passed will send signs to let you know they're okay. I pondered that explanation and wondered if it were true and that my father was still around me. A few days later, my best friend invited me to go to my favorite secret beach. I was having a hard day and was just down, thinking about my dad. Before I walked out the door, I said to my empty house, Dad, if it is you, I could use a quarter, and I will know you are always with me, and I'll never doubt it. I really wasn't expecting a rusty quarter to appear. We arrive at the beach. It was a sheltered cove and nobody else was there except us. It was a cove I loved snorkeling at, but it was low tide, so I lounged in water at the shore. My friend is an avid crab hunter, catching them on the rocks and then letting them go. He told me to stop moping and come catch crabs with him. Reluctantly, I agreed. I set my sights on a small crab and he scurried under an overhanging rock. I reached my hand back in the cave and stooped up the sand. I was sure I had caught him, but when I opened my hand, I saw a rusty quarter and cried. I still have 16 rusty quarters and to some, that's all they are. But to me, that's proof that I'm not alone and my dad is okay.